Hello everybody. Today, tonight, our first story will be the Emperor's New Clothes. So this is quite a popular story. Uh, I think I've heard quite a few versions of this one. Not read this one yet, so we will see how they measure up. Once there was an emperor who was always changing his clothes. He had a different outfit for every hour of the day. Whenever his ministers wanted him for something special, they always went to the royal clothes closet first. He was more likely to be there deciding what to change into next than passing laws in his council chamber or balancing the budget in his council. One day, two men arrived in town. They knew how fond the emperor was of new clothes, and they had hatched a plan. A crafty plan. They spread the news that they could weave the most beautiful cloth anyone had ever seen. And furthermore, it was magic and invisible to anyone who was stupid or unworthy of the position he held. I must have an outfit made from that marvellous new cloth everyone is talking about, said the emperor and he sent for the weavers. They agreed to weave some of the cloth for him and went away from the palace carrying silk and golden thread as well as a large sum of money. They hid the silk and golden thread in their packs and then set up their loom. There was the steady clack clack and the whir of a busy loom for days. The emperor was very anxious to see how the new cloth was coming along, but he was just a tiny bit afraid. What would I do if I could not see the cloth, he thought. And though he didn't think for a moment that he wasn't fit to be emperor, he sent his faithful old prime minister to look at the cloth in his place. The weavers led the prime minister to their loom. He could not see a single thread. Oh dear, he thought, if the emperor finds out that I can't see the cloth, I will lose my job. I must pretend I can see it. It is the most beautiful piece of cloth in the world, he told the emperor on his return to the palace. The emperor decided perhaps he would go and see it for himself after all. He gathered his favourite counsellors around him and went to the weavers. Show us our beautiful new cloth, he said. Can you not see it? It's there on the loom, said the weavers. So it is, so it is, said the emperor, his voice full of admiration and his heart full of shame because he could not see the cloth either. But then neither could anyone else, though everyone thought everyone else could see it. There were so many exclamations of delight at the beauty of the new cloth. It really was quite astonishing in the circumstances. Make me a suit of clothes from the cloth and I will wear it in procession tomorrow, said the emperor, outwardly smiling and inwardly trembling. The two weavers said that they were tailors too and that they would make the suit themselves. At eight o'clock next morning it was ready or so they told the emperor. The emperor bathed, he powdered his hair, he put on his shoes and stockings, and then he let the weavers dress him in the new set, the suit of clothes. It's a perfect fit, they said. It's a perfect fit, said all the councillors. It's a perfect fit, said the emperor, although he could see nothing but his own pink skin. When the emperor was ready, or thought he was, the procession through the streets of the town began. Everyone knew about the wonderful cloth. Everyone knew that only those worthy enough could see it, and that to everyone else it was invisible. Look at the emperor's new suit. Isn't it beautiful? sighed the people in the crowd as he walked proudly by. How well it fits. Ah, truly suit fit for an emperor. And then a little voice rang out above the others. It belonged to a boy who had never listened to gossip, and he hadn't heard the stories about the wonderful cloth. Besides, his father had taught him to always be truthful. The emperor has no clothes on, he shouted. Someone began to laugh. The boy's right, the emperor has no clothes on. The cry was caught up by the people in the crowd. The emperor has no clothes on. The poor emperor was shivering with cold, so he knew the crowd must be right. 
but he walked proudly through the streets and back to the palace with his head held high and his skin blushing a bright and glowing crimson. He sent guards to fetch the weavers so that they could be punished for daring to trick an emperor, but they had vanished and were never seen again. And from that day onwards, I'm glad to say, the emperor paid a little less attention to what he wore and more attention to the affairs of the state. sort of look that we have with the witch and these creepy trees. I have to say I've not heard of this fairy tale so I'm quite interested to see what it is. Once upon a time there was a witch who lived in a castle in the middle of a dark and tangled wood. At night she read her magic books but by day she changed herself into an owl and flew about the wood, ready to cast a spell on anyone who dared to get too close to her castle. One day a boy and girl were walking in the wood. They had a wedding to plan and a lot to talk about, and they went deeper in the wood and they went deeper into the wood than they intended. Just as the sun was about to set, Dringle said, We should turn for home, we are getting too close to the witch's castle. But it was already too late. For even as he spoke, an owl flew from the trees and circled round them. Hoo, 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 it cried. The witch's spell had been cast. Durango could not move and Jorinda had been turned into a little brown bird. The owl flew into the middle of a bush. There was a rustle and a moment later the old witch herself appeared. She caught the brown bird in a wicker cage and hurried away with it towards the castle. And though Joringo could see everything as it happened, he could do nothing to help Jorinda. He was rooted to the spot, and there he stayed, as still as a stone statue, until the old witch returned and removed the spell. Where is Jorinda? What have you done with her? Please bring her back to me, he begged. But the old witch was deaf to all this please. Go home, she said. Stop wasting my time. Jeringle tried again and again to get into the castle, but every time the witch was ready for him. Whenever he got to within a hundred paces of the grey crumbling walls, she cast her spell afresh and he could not move. He despaired of ever seeing Jorinda again, and then one night, when he had fallen into an exhausted and fitful sleep, he had a strange dream. He dreamed that he had found a large pearl in the centre of a beautiful red flower. In his dream he picked the flower and found that everything he touched with it was released from the witch's spell. When Joringo woke, he was determined to search until he found just such a flower. It was the only hope he had. He searched through the woods and the meadows for eight whole days, and then on the ninth day, he found a flower, just like the one in his dream, except that instead of a pearl nestling inside its velvety red petals, there was a bright and glistening dewdrop. Joringo picked it carefully, so that he did not disturb the dewdrop, then cradled it gently in his hands and hurried towards the castle. If only everything happens as it did in my dream, he whispered when he got as far as the castle door without being stopped. He had never got so close to the castle before. He touched the door with the flower. It flew open. As he walked through the dark and cobwebby castle, the witch danced round him, screeching and shouting and casting all the spells she could think of and making up lots of new ones too. But nothing worked. The flower's magic was stronger than hers. Presently, Jeringo came to a room where seven hundred wicker cages hung from hooks in the ceiling. Sitting forlornly in each cage was a sad brown bird. Out of seven hundred, how could he tell which was Jorinda? And then Jeringo saw this witch sneaking away with one of the cages hidden in the crook of her arm. He knew at once that that was Jorinda. He snatched the cage from the witch and opened the door. The instant the velvety red petals of the flower brushed against the bird's wing, it turned back into Jorinda. I knew you would come, she whispered. I knew you would find a way of rescuing me. 
Now that he had found Jorinda, Jeringle set about freeing all the other little brown birds from the witch's spell. Soon there were 700 empty cages swinging from the ceiling. From that day onwards, the witch lost her power to cast spells, and it was safe to walk anywhere in the woods, by day or by night. This is another very well-known story. Obviously for the Disney film version, this one seems to be a di bit different because already I see the word China and you can tell by the fashion and the clothing that it is set in China rather than in India as the Disney film is set. So let's see just how different it is. Once upon a time, there was a magician who went to China to find a magic lamp he had heard about. He knew it was hidden in an underground cave, and he knew that the only way to get into the cave was through a narrow passage. He knew too that if the clothes of anyone passing through the passage touched the walls, they would die. He didn't want to risk his own life, even for a magic lamp, so he befriended a Chinese boy called Aladdin and sent him into the cave. Wear this ring, said the magician, as Aladdin got ready to climb down into the passage. It may help to protect you. Protect me? Protect me from what? asked Aladdin. Nothing, said the magician quickly. There is nothing at all to be afraid of. Down you go, there's a good lad, and bring me the little lamp which you will find on the ledge at the back of the cave. The magician was nervous, and Aladdin seemed to be in the cave a very long time. He was just beginning to think Aladdin's clothes had touched the walls of the passage, and that he would never see him again, when he saw Aladdin's face framed in the gloom at the end of the passage. Have you got it? Give it to me, said the magician eagerly. Give me the lamp. He reached down and would have snatched the lamp from Aladdin, but Aladdin put it in his sleeve, and the magician could not reach it. Aladdin had a feeling that perhaps the magician was not to be trusted, so he said, Help me out first, then I will give you the lamp. Give me the lamp first, said the magician. Help me out first, said Aladdin. The magician wouldn't give in, and neither would Aladdin. Suddenly the magician lost his patience and his temper. If you will not give me the lamp, then you can stay in the cave forever, he shouted and he closed the entrance to the passage with a short, sharp spell and went away fuming. Poor Aladdin. He didn't know what to do. He sat in the dark and tried to think. Then he absentmindedly rubbed the ring which the magician had given him before he went into the cave. There was a hiss and a strange wispy figure waiting a turban curled up in the air in front of him like smoke from a fire. Aladdin gasped and shielded his eyes from the sudden light. Who, who are you? he asked. I am the genie of the ring. What is your command, O oh master? Can you take me home? asked Aladdin. Before Aladdin had time to blink, he found himself standing outside his own house, wondering if he was asleep or awake. He knew he couldn't be dreaming, and he found the lamp tucked inside his sleeve. He took it to his mother. He can sell this and buy food, he said. No one will buy a dusty old lamp, said Aladdin's mother. Let me clean it first. Oh, she had rubbed it but once, when there was a hiss and another strange figure appeared and wavered in the air like a wisp of smoke. Aladdin's mother was very frightened, but Aladdin asked, Who are you? I am the genie of the lamp. What is your command, O master? And that's how it came about that Aladdin and his mother became rich. Whatever they wanted, the genie of the lamp provided. And when Aladdin fell in love with a princess, he was rich enough to marry her and take her to live in a beautiful palace. Aladdin and his princess lived happily for a long time. They shared all their secrets except one. Aladdin never told the princess about the magic lamp. One day when Aladdin was out hunting, and the princess was at home in the palace, an old peddler called from the street. 
New lamps for old, new lamps for old. No. Though Aladdin had never spoken about the lamp to his princess, she had seen it. And when she heard the calls of the peddler, who was really the wicked magician in disguise, she thought, I will get Aladdin a new lamp. She ran into the street and exchanged what she thought was a useless and broken lamp for a bright and shining new one. Immediately he had the magic lamp in his hand. The magician dropped the basket and threw off his disguise. He 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 chortled. Now everything Aladdin has shall be mine. He summoned the genie of the lamp and ordered him to take him. Aladdin's palace and Aladdin's princess to faraway Africa. When Aladdin returned home there was nothing but dust and a bare patch where the palace had been. He guessed at once that the magician was responsible. He quickly summoned the genie of the ring. What is your command, O master? asked the genie. Please bring back my princess and my palace, said Aladdin. I cannot. Only the genie of the lamp can do that. Then take me to my princess wherever it may be commanded Aladdin. That the genie of the ring could do, and he did so. The princess was overjoyed to see Aladdin. I've come to take you home, said Aladdin. But first we must outwit the magician and retrieve the lamp. Slip this powder into his wine when he is not looking. The powder made the magician sleep, and while he slept, Aladdin was able to take the lamp from his pocket. Aladdin summoned the genie of the lamp. What is your command, O oh master? asked the genie. Leave the magician here in the middle of Africa and take the palace and everyone else in it back to China, said Aladdin. And that is what the genie of the lamp did, and everyone except the magician who woke up and found himself on a sand dune and who is still trying to work out how he got there, lived happily ever. <laughs>